I am deeply honored to accept the Ernest L. Boyer Award from the New American Colleges and Universities tonight. Dr. Boyer admonished us to rethink higher education with the student at the center of our mission and with the goal, not just of graduating and credentialing students, but helping them to be ready to lead our society into a better future. I can think of no bigger responsibility and no better ambition. It is humbling to receive this award named for the great Ernest Boyer, and there are so, so many more people who deserve it than I. All I can say is that no one person ever receives an award alone. An award like this is always about what we all aspire to as a profession. Therefore, I would like to accept this on behalf of all of us as educators and as lifelong students. When we come to meetings like this one, when we belong to professional organizations such as this, we do so because we are still students. We all learn from one another, and our learning never stops. I would like to dedicate my talk tonight to the memory of Dr. Boyer and to all of you with personal thanks, professional gratitude, and enormous appreciation for all you do. I wish to thank the New American Colleges and Universities for this Boyer Award and the Association of American Colleges and Universities for hosting this keynote address tonight. I also especially wish to thank the president of the New American Colleges and University, President Nancy Hensel, for her support leading up to my talk tonight and for encouraging me to focus tonight's remarks on something I truly love, which is on the classroom itself, something I don't often get to talk about. I've spent the last two decades working on different kinds of educational and institutional reform, focusing on such things as credentialing and assessment and rankings and technology and interdisciplinarity and curriculum and graduate training, engagement, diversity, and so forth, all of those extremely vitally important and interconnected things. They also can be extremely slow going and sometimes frustrating. Such change, such institutional change can be hard. What I love so much about talking about classroom change is it can happen tomorrow. It's a paradigm shift that happens not just in the head, but in the heart, and not just in students, but in their teachers. When you see that when you turn your classroom into a student-centered environment, everybody changes. It's also optimistic, because when you see your students change, you realize change is possible. Not incremental change, but actual uh, dispositions to change. So thank you, Nancy, for encouraging me to talk tonight literally about the things we've been doing for the last two decades in actual classrooms. Um, you've seen that there's, there are um, index cards on everybody's seat and pencils, and you'll actually be doing some classroom exercises tonight. I'm going to begin tonight with an epigraph from Ernest Boyer. Engagement means connecting the rich resources of the university to our most pressing social, civic, and ethical problems, to our children, to our schools, to our teachers, and to our cities. In every myth, there's a doorway, a gate, a portal, a river, a ladder, a mountain, a pathway. There's a threshold, and if you are the hero, your journey requires you to cross over. It's that simple. You start on one side, and your challenge is to make your way across to the other. In American life, in most modern life worldwide, the threshold that looms largest and that defines almost everything else is the age of majority. One day, you are the legal responsibility of a parent or a guardian. The next, you and you alone, are legally responsible for yourself. At 17 years and 364 days old, your parents can tell you what to do. When you wake up the next morning at 18, they cannot. You've crossed over before and after. In individual and social terms, the consequences of that crossing are so vast that they are constantly being debated in our society. How old do you have to be to drink, to be tried and executed as an adult, to go to war, to vote, 
Sometimes it's 18, sometimes it's 21, with the exact age fiercely argued, because it matters. And not just to you, the individual, but to your society. Your journey is a stand-in for something else, for the life and death issues we grapple with as a society. That's why we can't make up our minds about when childhood ends, when adult responsibility begins, when the torch will be passed. The journey is a stand-in for what we believe should be the future of our entire community. Your journey is our journey, how you are prepared to enter and perhaps lead a community, a generation, matters to those who have gone before you and those who come after. It has weight. That's why it comes with spectacles and cheering crowds and ceremonies. You are crossing from definition by others to self-definition, from dependence on other human beings to legal independence. If you were born fortunate, you're moving from a life of nurturance by others into a time of self-care, self-care for the rest of your life. That's the stuff of mythology from the epic of Gilgamesh forward. Sometimes we call that college. <laughs> I've witnessed this, witness, this transition thousands of times over the four decades that I've been teaching college. I started young, teaching my first class when I was 22. I began as a total skeptic, never a good student myself. But as I witnessed the transformation of my students, I came to realize that no matter how good or bad I might be as a teacher, my real role is as a guide along a much greater journey that begins after my course ends, after the streamers from graduation come down. And it doesn't matter if my students are traditional or so-called non-traditional. They are in college, and that's the key. In one of the first courses I ever taught, I was 24 years old, and my youngest student in the course was 32 years old. <laughs> Those returning non-traditional students still look to me as a guide. Depending on how you count, between 40 and 70% of our current students are non-traditional. It doesn't matter. All 21 million students in college are on a journey, and they have one thing in common. They are there willingly. No one made them do it. They are voluntarily making sacrifices of time, money, and willpower to be in college because they want something bigger, better. It isn't just about a job. It isn't just because they want to be workforce ready. Any pundit who says students are in college just for a job is a liar. The world is full of brutalizing, low-paid, dehumanizing jobs. If you have the fortitude to be in college, you have what it takes to, be, to have one of those. You make the sacrifice to go to college because you're looking for something else and something more. You're in college as an act of faith and hope that you'll be able somehow to find that right thing, that right match between your skills, your talents, and if you are incredibly lucky, your passions and that which realistically will allow you to support yourself while contributing meaningfully to the world. And I want to make a aside here, by no means do I think you have to have a college degree to have a meaningful work, but to have meaningful work is one of the luxuries, the great luxuries of any human being on this planet. This is far more than workplace readiness. This is life readiness, society readiness, future readiness. It's why, why, inspired by great educators like Ernest Boyer, I spent the last two decades in, committed to engaged, student-centered learning, to finding all the ways that higher education can help each and every student find that special connection between their aspirations and their possible ways of thriving in the world while making this beleaguered, unfair world a better place. But it's a challenge. And the biggest challenge, in my mind, is our legacy. We've inherited a system of formal education that is not structured for students who are on a mission of self-discovery. Rather, it's a system that was designed to school students to the regulations and the requirements of the machine. We have a legacy from a different era in which structural inequalities of race, gender, sex, and nativism are literally structured into the inputs and outputs of formal education. All the metrics by which we admit students, 
We grade students, we rank students, and by which we rank and reward our colleges and universities and those who teach in them. These were structures built into our educational system designed from roughly 1865 to 1925 to shape a different world, an industrial world. We are inheritors, inheritors of that legacy. And it's no surprise that now nearly 90% of our full-time professorate is white and nearly 60% male. As long as we have pedagogical methods that are based on standardization, hierarchy, and apprenticeship, those structural inequalities continue to be preserved and replicated generation after generation. We have a structural mismatch between our professorate and our students. We have, as well, a mismatch between our students' aspirations and the legacy structures of formal education that we have inherited. That's the bad news. The good news? We can change this. So we're about to have use of those note cards. Second part of this is not going to be a red talk. I think I can do this now. I think we all know that the 19th century had a huge, huge project. And the project was somehow to transform farmers into factory workers and shopkeepers into corporate citizens. I mean, that was an enormous educational project, right? To teach people how to sit in rows, to keep time, to do things on time, to do things they were told to do in an orderly fashion. These are new um, regulatory worlds um, to teach human bodies to be machines. Um, when I was writing my last book, I read through the archives of almost all of compulsory education um, in the United States and was shocked at the debates that went on between 1852 and 1918 as compulsory education was passed in state after state at how obsessed people were with time. At what month of what year would someone, want, so would a child be required to start school, right? It varied from state to state, but there was a law about when it would be. Would it be sixth year and fourth month? Sixth year and fifth month? Varied, but it had to be specified. And when would they be allowed not to be in school? There were laws and rules about what time the day would start. There were laws and rules about how many days in the year. What would happen if you missed a day, right? These are the legacies we all live with now, right? I'm now with this, talking to this organization where our aspirations are so high. Right? If we have a snow day this week, right, won't we all have Wednesdays that meet as Fridays or Fridays that meet as Tuesdays? Am I wrong? Right? Don't you all have those? Right? It's a weird legacy, a weird legacy of our aspirations to find every student's inner truth and find a way that they can find that and find a way to support themselves in the world, melded onto a world where we're teaching them how to be either assembly line workers or managers of assembly lines. That's the obstacle we all have to work with, right? I think there are ways to do it. So, first little thing on the note cards that you have, quickie, two second one. Uh, take uh, literally two seconds, don't think about it, just what year do you think this photo was taken? And I'm just going to ask a show of hands. Uh, anyone think it was taken in the 80, and before 1980? What, did anyone write before 1980? Oh. Okay. Before 1970? Some people before. Before 1960? Okay. So 1970s, 1980s, anyone thought it was the 1980s? 1990s? Okay. 2000s? Uh, 2010? Okay. 2014? Okay. You actually got it right. It was 2014. <laughs> <laughs> what's weird, what's weird though, is there was a smattering across all that time period, right? And really, you could have made a case for any of those. 
I had to find one that didn't have any iP- I, you know, iPhones in it, right? But on April 22nd, 1993, something amazing happened. That was the day a bunch of academics, the scientists from the National Center for Supercomputing App- Applications, walked outside, held a press conference, and said the Mosaic 1.0 browser would now be available for free for anybody in the world. For the first time in all human history, anyone who had an idea could communicate that idea to anybody else in the world who had an internet connection without an editor, right? Without a radio station, without a TV station, without any mediator. I had the power to write to anyone in the world. They could write to me, no mediator, right? That's an astonishing human power and a really troubling one, right? That was basically the day the internet was invented. And it's hard to say how our classrooms, our physical architecture of our classrooms have changed, right? Our work lives have certainly changed, right? Our everyday lives have certainly changed. This classroom is not so different, right, from the one on the left, right? It is still the 19th century classroom. And how? We know how that 19th century classroom prepared you to be assembly line worker, right? It's the same structure of those people that were at the sewing machines in a sweatshop that we saw on the first slide. How does it prepare you for a world where all the world's information fits you in the palm of your hand? How does that, how does it prepare you for a world where any time, day or night, all of the world's information is there, right? I am positive, I'm not saying anything new to anybody, that when you're at the beach on vacation, your work doesn't stop, right? It's still in your iPhone, and you can't ignore it because there also might be a text from your mother who's homesick, right? Right? Instead of this segmented world, right? We all know what the 19th century was, leisure, labor, right, the invention of the weekend, all those things we fought hard for in in terms of labor unions and labor laws in the 19th century, it's all mixed and merged in something that fits in the palm of our hand and it works the other way too, right? At work and in school, we're constantly distracted too. How does our 19th century classroom possibly prepare us for this crazy merged world we now live in now? If the project of the 19th century was to prepare us to be humans who could act like machines. How does the project of the 21st century education, how does the project of 21st century education prepare us for a world where the whole world fits into a computer the size and that fits in the palm of our hand, right? We haven't begun to think of that, except I'm gonna talk about a number of techniques that are all about teaching us not how to use expensive or fancy technology. That's why I like to use index cards. It's the best kind of technology. Machine-made paper, machine-made pencils, very cheap, very exp- inexpensive. You don't need to have an internet connection, but it's about interaction and interactivity. It's about taking responsibility. It's about having connection to other people. Okay. There's, how many of you read this in the Chronicle of Higher Education this year? It's fabulous. I just cheered when this happened. A class at the University of Illinois wrote a letter back to two, but it could have been to a hundred, op-eds written by adults. Um, These two op-eds happened to be defenses of the lecture that made some pretty obnoxious comments about young people today. We have to lecture these young people because they don't read. We have to lecture these young people because they come into our classrooms and they just want to play on their play video games on their laptops. We have to lecture these young people because they have no self-control. These young people said, hey, we want to write back. I, I think this is worth reading out loud. I want to just spend some time with this. Instead of, and this is a, a brief version of the letter that, uh, that they wrote together. Um, Instead of debating the lecture, instead of imagining what students are thinking, get to know us. Find out what college is like for us now, rather than what it was like for you years ago. Condemning or celebrating the lecture isn't as useful as understanding what we need. So please ask us. 
I actually don't. I'm kind of agnostic about the lecture or the seminar. The research we have is that the seminar is every bit as unequal as the lecture class, right? In both, we tend to replicate who we are. We tend to replicate and reward the kind of student that gives us the kinds of responses we recognize as smart. Right? We never know. Uh, we also we know from seminars, even tiny ones with only six or eight students, that faculty tend to think everybody participates when 20% participate. Right? Partly that's because it feels so awful when nobody talks. Right? So if one person hogs the seminar, we're just so grateful that there isn't that awful silence in the room. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, right. One of the things I believe is we have to structure our classrooms to work against the basic structural inequality of everything students bring into the classrooms with them and everything that exists structurally and inequally outside of the classrooms. So what, we're going to be ta- what I'm going to be talking about in the second part of this, um, after a quick little a second exercise, are ways to come up with ways to ask students, what do you think? to ask students, what's your contribution? To ask students, how do you feel about this? To ask students, how can you take responsibility for your own learning? To ask students, how can you not be a machine, but actually try to find what your aspirations are? To ask students, how can you contribute something that I don't even know you have to contribute to this learning experience? To ask students, how can you set the bar higher then I even know to set it as your teacher. Because right? that's the biggest thing I've found in 20 years of doing student-centered learning, is however high I think I'm setting the bar, if I ask my students to set the bar high, they always go higher. Always. They ha- 20 years of doing this, I've never yet been let down. Okay? So I'm going to just go through eight Simple things that anyone can do. And by the way, all of these are things I also do in um, various kinds of committee meetings. They work with colleagues um, as well as with students because we replicate in our committee meetings exactly the behaviors our students do uh, have in, in seminars. First one is another one for note cards. And this is a 90 second one. I'm going to set my timer for 90 seconds. And I, this one is yours. So just 90 seconds, quickly, on the cards. Take 90 seconds, very quickly, and this is going to have a couple of parts to it. The first part, just jot down very quickly, what are your best methods? Say three best methods for encouraging participation. If you're teaching now, do it in your classrooms. If you're not teaching, in faculty and staff meetings and workshops and treats, give it a shot. Your three best methods. It always feels like about an hour up here. I mean, if you think it's bad when students don't answer a question, to be a speaker in a room this big and have it be silent for 90 seconds really is terrible. Okay. Now, I know it's the first night of um, AAC and you, so it's kind of like the first day of class. I want you to turn to somebody, ideally someone you don't know, and um, it works best if you do this as a formal exercise, I'd, where one person reads the things on their card, and the other person listens, then the second person reads a thing on their part, the other person listens, and then come up with one that you agree. See, what, just talk about it. Just, again, 90 seconds, no biggie. Just listen, speak, listen to each other, and talk. That was the single best one I've ever done, and I'm like 200 times of doing that. That was amazing. Wow, you're going to have a great conference. <laughs> Needless to say, I could leave right now. You don't need the other ones, right? I mean, that's a formal method called think, pair, share, right? How many people have done that before? Do you all know think, pair, share? Oh, so you're old hats at this, so you're pros. You cheated. Okay. (laughs) It's astonishing the difference between the energy in a room when people are exchanging ideas. It's incredible. Right? It's a great thing. And I now do think picture at some point in every single class. And my students, so at, along with textbooks and PDFs and everything else my students buy, they buy a stack of index cards. Right? Sometimes we have an internet connection, sometimes we don't. Right? It's not always reliable, but they always have the index cards. It's amazing to me how often my students will say, hey, I think we better do think picture right now. So, <laughs> 
Sometimes it'll be because we're in a debate and no one likes each other. And performing a debate in public is really different than working it out one-on-one with somebody. Uh, Sometimes it'll be because we just don't kind of know where there's, the energy has flagged. Sometimes we don't know where we're going, but it always works, right? Um, I like to have the last version, the sharing beyond the classroom, being some way that we put it on a class website so we can share it with the, other, with the world beyond what we're doing. Pretty much everything we do is being watched by other people who are trying to learn from us, and it, it also gives my students a sense that, excuse me, what they do, are doing matter. I also think that hearing your own voice is so important for issues of equity and access. I'll be talking about that later, so I don't want to steal that punchline because I've, I've got a great one coming up of, from Samuel Delaney, and I don't want to undercut what uh, he says. But yes, think, Pierre Shar. Thank you. That was really fabulous. I hope you have lots of conversations um, the rest of the conference that are as, as energetic as that 90 seconds was. Two, I started about five years ago, maybe longer, maybe it was eight years ago, Um, having my students write a class constitution on the first day of class, where they write the rule, the constitution for the course. Um, I don't like to have them do it from scratch because sometimes they get muddled up, so I bring in different constitutions. Um, If it's a technology class, I'll bring in the Mozilla Manifesto or um, the Agile Manifesto. Um, Sometimes I bring in the preamble to the U.S. Constitution. or other constitutions, this, and then, this is a student, an undergraduate student who told me this, he said, you have to leave the room, we're not gonna do it if you're in the room, we're gonna treat you like the mom, get out of here. So now I always leave the room. And we do it, usually do it on a Google Doc, uh, put up a constitution, now it's several generations later, so I'll often, and students love this, because they like to compete with the class before them, I'll often put up the class before them's constitution and let them go at it, and make their own constitution. But they come up with all of the terms of what they want to do in the class, what they want to accomplish, what their principles are, right? It's, it's a wonderful exercise for students to really come to terms with what they want, what they want out of the class, what this class is going to mean to them, so that every assignment somehow goes back to how they're going to proceed in the class. Um, I often do co- contract grading. Actually, I'll talk about that in a little bit later, too. And they'll often specify grading and assessment versions um, in the Constitution as well, but they really come up with a whole document that they'll refer back to, often amend. Um, more than once I've had students say, I want to make an amendment to our Constitution, or this violates our Constitution. It's quite a collect- It's a very interesting collective um, document. Uh, recently, I've been doing it for committee meetings, Uh, Rather than setting a charge when I've called meetings, I've said to the group assembled, let's write a constitution together and make our own charge and decide committee assignments together rather than having me as the chair of a committee coming up with those assignments. Talk about a transformation. If I, as as an administrator or a committee chair, assign somebody something, it's one thing. If, as a group, people take on responsibilities, entirely different. Entirely different. Highly recommend it. Two. This is my favorite, favorite assignment. I've done it so many times now, I probably can't get away with it anymore. The first time I did this was probably 2006. I handed out my index cards, and I said, 90 seconds, write on the index card who invented the printing press. And of course, in 10 seconds, they all wrote an answer. I said, okay. If you hand me that index card and you're right, you don't have to come to another class and you have an A in the class. And one of the students said, what happens if we hand you the index card and we're wrong? I said, well, you fail. (laughs) Duh. And I said, if you don't trust what you wrote on the index card, you're allowed to turn over the index card. You can use any device you have with you and you can do some research. Well, needless to say, I've done this, as I said, since 2006 in many, many classes. I've never had a student hand me that index card. You all know. What did they write on the index card? Gutenberg. Okay. What did they find out from their devices? That in 9th century China, Bisheng invented movable type. Then it goes to Korea in the 10th century. Then it comes back to China. Then it goes to Iran. Then it gets developed, etc. And eventually in 1440, Gutenberg 
um, does something called what we in the West call the printing press, right? It's a great way of saying to students, one, there's a world of information out there that's not on those standardized tests that got you into college, right? It's a second way of saying digital literacy is not just about technology, it's about epistemology. It's about now that we have things like Wikipedia, Remember back in 2005? Oh, I got so much trouble in trouble for that. Do you remember? Um, there's some Duke friends here. I got in so much trouble because I said, we should be teaching Wikipedia, not banning it. There were colleges saying, we must ban Wikipedia. It's like, wait, the world is contributing knowledge that we don't have in any textbook because all the textbooks that we're reading were published in the West and we're going to ban this? Really? Why don't we have students figure out if this is authentic knowledge or not? That's what digital literacy is. Right? Not banning something, but seeing what is authentic, what is real, what kinds of knowledge are contesting what we think really are um, the right, what's on the other side of that index card, right? How much is on the other side of that index card, right? And it's a great way of telling students that it may have been a standardized test, A, B, C, D, or none of the above, that got you into this, um, into this, into college, and we may be at a very deplorable moment in human history where standardized testing, um, um, I actually think it's a kind of child abuse, but that's um, perhaps hyperbolic. Um, um, I mean, you know, most of the research we say I know about standardized testing is that it pretty much teaches you how to be great at standardized testing. That does not seem like a good use of our time. But it does teach students other ways of knowing. Other way, and, and it also answers that question, which I think is one of the dullest questions we have. Do you allow technology in the classroom? What? You shouldn't allow anything in the classroom unless it has a use in the classroom, Right? That, I, I allow an iPad in the classroom if you have a good use for the iPad in the classroom, right? Why would you ban an iPad in the classroom if there's a use for it? Why would you have an iPad in the classroom if you don't have an intrinsically useful, creative, important way of using it in the classroom? Four. This is the one I didn't want to undercut because it's so wonderful. The great science fiction writer Samuel Delaney was 45, I believe, 44 or 45, when he took the, his first teaching job. And he was shocked. He doesn't have any college degree at all, no college degrees. So he goes to college, right? Here he's the writer who's got a college degree, but so proud. He was shocked when he asked a question, and there were students who sat in back and looked ashamed. He was shocked. He himself is African-American. He was especially shocked that there were African-American students in his class, especially men, who sat in the back of the room and never made eye contact. He was shocked. Um, there's a video. Uh, I don't have the URL here. If you write me, I can send you the URL, where he actually weeps when he's talking about this. He, and, and this is a truncated version. It's a very beautiful quote. Every time you don't answer a question, you're learning how to make do with what you've got, and you're learning how not to ask for a raise. You're learning how to take it. That's not good. So from now on, whenever I ask a question, everybody's got to put their hand up. I don't care whether you know or not. You need to teach people they are important enough to say what they have to say. And he literally does this. He asks a question, and then everyone physically raises their hand. And what we know from cognitive neuroscience is that alone is a way of physically saying, I am here. It's a way of testifying. I am in this room. I am present. I am doing something. I am here. Right? And then if you, once you've raised your hand, he can call on anybody. And you have three options. You can either say the answer, if you know it. You can say, I didn't understand the question, and then there's always a follow-up, why don't you understand the question, and it's a dialogue. Or you can say, I really don't know the answer, but I think my friend Bob does. <laughs> what Delaney says, though, is that when everybody knows that that's going to be the method in the class, people read more, they engage more, and it becomes kind of a game 
but it also becomes a kind of solidarity. And what he finds is by the second or third class, the students aren't just putting up their hands. They're holding each other's hands. They're slapping hands. They're active. They're engaged. The whole mien of the class changes. And the students who were hiding before feel honored and are honored and often turn out to have the smartest, wisest, most perceptive things to say. Right? He says it changed. That simple gesture is not simple at all. That's what I mean by a paradigm shift in something that can change tomorrow. Right? These are people who, instead of learning how to take it, have learned that they are there, that they exist, that they real, they're real. They deserve their education. They deserve a place in that classroom. They have earned it. They deserve it. They have a voice. They deserve to be heard. Five. I learned this one from half of these things I'm, I've ripped off from my students or from other people, right? These are just a compendium of things that we've been doing at Haystack and in other organizations for a long time. I love this one. Also index cards. One of my friends does this at McGill University with 600 students in a lecture class. Okay. Every class, you end every class by asking students to write three questions or ideas that came from that day's class. Have them sign it. It's a pop quiz, it's attendance, and it allows you to then have material that starts the next day of class. With 600 students, the TAs then sort things out, helps make the class the next time. Again, it's attendance. It's, it's perfect. But it also means to the students, think about the symbolism of that. The end of a class is the beginning, right? It's a fantastic metaphor. Right? Not just for a class, but for life, for education, for everything. Things don't end. Right? Learning doesn't end. Learning is a place for questions. Learning is a place for ideas. Learning is what you build on. It's that mission. It's that carrying over. It's that mountain pass. It's the pathway. It's a fantastic, fantastic idea. Six, find ways to count what you value. This, by the way, is one of my favorite artists. Uh, it's Nick Susanis. Uh He's somebody we met at an early Haystack meeting where he came to this meeting at Ann Arbor and said he was writing a doctoral dissertation at Columbia Teachers College uh, on comics and what you can learn from comics, and he wanted to write a doctoral dissertation on comics as a comic. And I'm very proud to say that it was the, it won all the prizes, it got all the best of conference uh, peer uh, awards from the conference, and uh, he did turn it in as a dissertation at Columbia and Harvard University Press published it immediately. Uh, last year that was, and it's been on the top 10 list at the, uh, oh my gosh, of books all over the world. I mean, it's really just had an amazing success as a comic book. It's called Unflattening, and it's a theory of visuality and education in um, this is something about standardized testing and the difference and what what happens when you see the world in terms of discrete little boxes and standardized ideas of the world. But how brave, right, to write a dissertation on comics as a comic? Uh, he's a very, very brave, brave person. Um, I've been doing contract grading um, through the MacArthur Foundation, the Digital Media Learning Competition. We've had a, several years working on badging. Uh, I'm now working with LaGuardia Community College, which has been, uh, uh, has had a long uh, engagement with portfolios and developing ideas of portfolios and working on portfolios. I know many, many people at this conference are doing lots of alternative um, assessments. Uh, I think it's really, really important for students to be involved in the process of peer evaluation. When we do those constitutions, one of the things they do is come up with thinking about what kinds of things really matter in a classroom? Is it the right grade, or is it also collaboration, project management, the person who gets a project done, uh, not just the person who has the first idea, but the person who finishes a project through to completion? How do you reward those things? How do you evaluate those things? What is evaluation? Those are the kinds of life skills that actually do help somebody find a, uh, the, the career that might make the career after college, that really do have a carryover um, into, the light, into the workplace later on and into uh, many, many different ways um, into uh, future life beyond college. Contribute to public knowledge. Um, 
I also got in trouble several years ago and was again in the New York Times for abolishing the term paper. I didn't know I was that pow powerful. I think term papers still exist in the world. But in fact, I never, 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 never require students to write a paper that I'm the only person um, who will read them. I just don't do that. Uh, if a student writes a paper, it's got to have an audience other than me. It has to be a paper that's not written the night before just to get a grade that I put on the paper that the student may or may not ever read my comments or, or it has to have another use. So my, we usually have a class, on the simplest level, a class blog, but often there will be a class blog with some kind of a purpose. Uh, it might be um, advocacy, it might be informational, it might be finding a small historical society, if it's a, if it's a class in a historical society where my students will do research and help contribute to public research. Uh, one year, maybe Charlie, that was, I don't know if you were a student at that time. My students, um, in, when I was at Duke University, uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, was um, putting on, I had it, the centennial of the Wilmington riots, which were race riots that whites um, had against African Americans during Reconstruction. And my students realized that there were almost no materials on this, and my students did maps of the city of Wilmington, uh, maps of who was buried in the cemetery, did historical research, made pamphlets, and actually did a whole, I mean, it was quite astonishing. It became this amazing project uh, that went on actually for about four years, where the students redid the history of Wilmington uh, and made this whole centennial happen, all as part of this massive research project as I said, that went on for um, several, re several, several years running. Those were term papers, but they were term papers with a difference and a point and a real, a real purpose. Um, last year at the City University of New York, I had the uh, honor to team teach with the President Emeritus um, of the Graduate Center, who is now the new Mellon Director of the New York Public Library, it's recently announced. And we taught 12 students who were all at that time teaching in one of the CUNY four-year or two-year colleges. And everything we did in our class as an experiment, they did out in their CUNY campuses. And we made a tool for the 365 undergraduates so they could comment on how well we were doing. So some undergraduate who was taking a random computer science class at John Jay College uh, suddenly was giving feedback to the president emeritus of the, at the Graduate Center, the former acting chancellor of the entire CUNY system. Talk about power, right? But each of the students in the 365 students was also doing something in their class, whether it was in a classics class or a computer science class, that made a difference in their com community. One of my favorite was the art history class. The students found all of the free art available in the borough of Brooklyn and made maps and found ways to distribute those maps in many different languages, in Chinese grocery stores in Chinese, in bodegas in Spanish. Right? And the professor, who was one of my graduate students, gave extra credit to students if they could bring five people who had never been into an art exhibit or an art museum into a museum. Well, suddenly, these students were bringing their grannies into the art museums. Many of these art museums were free, but think about what an art museum looks like. It, they look, they're supposed to be free in public. Everything about the architecture of the art museum, built by the robber barons, right, of the, of the, the last generation, everything says stay out unless you're elite. So here were many of these immigrants, a lot of grannies, a lot of the grannies were going into these art museums they didn't think they were allowed into seeing art for the first time, and best of all, it was their grandkids who were going to college. Their college student grandkids that were taking time to bring them into art museums, right? Talk about a public contribution to knowledge. Suddenly, art history was alive. It was history. It was community, it was college, it was giving back to your community, it was making taxpayers' money useful to the people who needed those free resources, 
right? It's not so hard to do, right? That is Ernest L. Boyer's mission, right? That is engagement, that is diversity, that is, and it's not hard to do. It's not changing everything about a 19th century structure. It's something anybody can do. Um, I started, used to start having my students write a mission statement, like a university mission statement for classes. And I've started, just in the last two years, having them write a mission statement on the last day of class. Having each student write a mission statement about their own mission. Now that they've had a class, what that mission is going to be for the rest of their lives. Because I really do want them to feel that there was a mountain or a pathway or something that was an obstacle and they've crossed over and now they have that power and now they can climb higher and that they have been educated higher but I guess I don't really want them just to be standing on the mountaintop. What I really hope is that they really go higher. So that's my ambition. I hope that you, there was something there that's useful and that you're able to take away. Certainly, none of those ideas are my own. They're all things that I've learned from other people. Thank you so much for, well, for the Boyer Award, for being here, for what you're going to do the next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for about 10 minutes for questions. We have about 10 minutes for questions. I'm happy to take questions if anyone has any questions. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, everybody raise your hand, right? <laughs> yes. Your ideas are obviously so energizing. Why hasn't it happened everywhere? You know, I think there's... Um, uh, the question was, the idea, if the ideas are energizing, why haven't they happened everywhere? First of all, they're happening more and more places, right? I mean, Haystack was like this crazy idea before MySpace, and now there's 13,000 people, and it's just... I don't... Put, I mean, I do put, I blog on Haystack, but it's a self-creating network. People just put their own ideas up there, and the ideas flow like water. I mean, it's crazy how much is up there. So there are, is a lot happening. Two, though, we're all educators because... Many of us were educators because we were straight-A students. And it's really, really hard for straight-A students not to be straight-A students. Um, it's really hard for the student who was in... The comment I hear the most often is, I don't know if I want to just have other people talk in class, because when I was a student, it used to make me annoyed and mad when the dumb people were talking. <laughs> and my comment always is that you shouldn't be a teacher. You should not be a teacher. But um, it's hard. It's hard. I mean, I have an advantage. I'm dyslexic, and I was a, t I was a terrible student for much of my, um, my education. So um, I have a bit of an advantage in being nice to the dyslexic and the students who are bad students. But I do, I empathize with, I do empathize with that, and it's hard to give up. On the other hand, when you walk students, like, so what I'm doing now is I'm teaching graduate students basically how to, okay, here's another version of this. Culture is important. And if you're, a, if you're a professor, you've gone through a lot of culture to make you a professor. So a lot of what these methods are is deconstructing not only 150 years of training this way, but your own enculturation and reward system that has said this is the way to do things. And I've been in the New York Times at least half a dozen times being called a, you know, a charlatan for these kinds of methods, right? It, that's fine. I, am a f I have tenure, right? <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's, that's what tenure should be for, right? In fact, if you don't use your tenure for this, you should give up your tenure, right? I mean, I really, you know, I mean, that's, um, you know, but, um, but it's hard. And also, many of the most conservative, resisting people are people who are not educators, but say, hey, I went, when I, you know, the, the um, uh, what's that called, the initiation mentality, like, I went through that, 
If I had to do it, you have to do it. Coddling, right? Our president talks about coddling students, the coddling word, right? We, all, we think if students, if, we're, if we don't do something, we also tend to, we, it's hard to get over the idea that if we're, something isn't standardized and we can't measure it in some standardized metric, that somehow it's, it's not quite right. It's easy, right? Even though most things we learn outside of school have no standardized metric, and we don't think they're easy. I don't go have a standardized test for karate, right? And if I have a black belt in karate, no one says I'm, it's easy because I didn't take the standardized test, right? You know, so there's lots, lots mitigating against it. You know, lots litigating, mitigating against it. It's a great question, though. Also, some schools punish you. So let's just, let's just say that, right? There are some schools that punish you for not, ha you have to, so one thing I advise when I work with young teachers especially who are doing these things is to really document and use the literature and quote people who have tenure, um, uh, you know, and quote the research, right? Because, it, because you can be vulnerable. Even departments. Even departments, yes, yes. If the great project of the last century or the 19th century was to teach us, this is not on. It's on. Oh, it is okay. Uh, was to teach us how to be uh, machines? Uh, would you say the great project of this century, with information technology, is to teach us how to be human again? Hmm. Hmm. I wish. I mean, I'm on the board of Mozilla, so I have to say yes. <laughs> um, you know, part of me thinks it's, it's to teach us how not to be surveyed, uh, surveilled, uh, how to keep our privacy, how to, you know, uh, how to keep certain kinds of boundaries, how to uh, learn how to survive in an information ecology. Um, but the positive part is I do think there is something incredibly connected and communitarian about things. I mean, who would have thought that some of the most successful, nobody, Okay, so I'll just answer the question. If you go back to 2002, nobody thought Wikipedia would be successful. Nobody, including, um, tell me, the founders of Wikipedia. Nobody. If you go back to 2005, nobody thought Facebook would be anything huge. There is something about people wanting to contribute their knowledge that's compelling. As educators, we should love that, right? Nobody pays you, and people want to contribute their knowledge? I mean, that's kind of astonishing, right? It's astonishing. Um, and that people want community, right? Here we live in this 150 years of, of being spread apart, moved around, um, separated from people who mean things to us, and suddenly, I don't know, I bet, a show of hands, how many people suddenly, because of Facebook or the internet in some way, are in contact with somebody that they never dreamed they would be in contact with again? Not always a good thing. <laughs> But it's kind of an amazing thing, right? Right? Is that technology or is that learning to be a little bit more human again? Yeah. So I like, thank you. I like that. That's a kindly way of saying it. I like that. I like that. And we have to be careful. <laughs> right. Anyone else? Thank you so much for such an enlightening uh, lecture. I wanted to go back to your point where you mentioned that 90% of the pref uh, professors are Caucasian. I think it's actually 87 87, okay. Of uh, full-time, full-time. Sure, full-time. Um, now that we're a minority, uh, minority majority nation, um, and you mentioned that, that um, statistic, uh, what do you envision as far as increasing the pipeline for 
minorities being educators. And we certainly are seeing more reports, in, especially in STEM, how there is actually quite a bit of funding to try to move that pipeline along. Uh, but what are your thoughts about especially that you're in the trench lines, working with community colleges in New York City and, and across the nation as well. Um, what are your thoughts about um, this pipeline? Thank you. So first of all, I don't, I mean, it's, it, it's why I'm doing what I'm doing now. I'm so concerned about that. Um, I think unless we change the pedagogy and what actually happens in the classroom, we're going to have a pipeline and a dropout rate that mirrors, that and we're going to end up with a result that replicates the situation we have now. That one of the reasons I think changing the classroom dynamic is so important is it's going to be a long time before we have anything like uh, a professorate that um, uh, represents the same uh, racial or gender diversity of our student body. And if we're just having a uh, pedagogy that's based on hierarchy, uh, standardization, and apprenticeship or imitation, we're going to end up replicating the disparity and the structural inequality. So for me, the most important thing of asking the students, of, of structuring participation, is validating who those students are um, I also have been involved in many programs um, in the last two years since I've been at the Graduate Center, CUNY, that are about peer mentoring. So in that, when I showed that map where I was teaching, Bill Kelly and I were teaching graduate students who were teaching undergraduates, 10% of those 365 undergraduates then uh, went through a peer mentoring class, uh, and they are mentoring other undergraduates this year. And those students were extremely diverse in every imaginable way. And this year we hope to have 20% and next year 40%. So peer mentoring is one of the ways and we're able to find some funding and we're hoping to have more funding um, to do that. Peer mentoring is one of those ways. And that's all about empowering students, um, training students to be peer mentors, uh, making that an actual credential that will help them in their own life path and their life mission. Uh, because we all know that teaching is the best way for them to learn. So our peer mentors are also s succeeding in all kinds of interesting ways because of their own um, giving back to, their own, to other students. Um, you know, there's a, 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 a whole role for them as peer mentors in terms of their own development, their own process, but it's a complicated process, and unless, and I, you know, again, you can't counter structural inequality with goodwill. You have to structure equality, right? You have to look at the situation, do everything you can on every level to come up with a, 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 a um, something that tries to address the situation. You have to involve the community, whatever that community is, in every way that's possible, make the find leaders in that community, uh, whatever the particular community is that you're that you're addressing, and empower that community in a, in the most um, structured, supportive way possible. Otherwise, it, otherwise we won't change. Otherwise, it won't change, and the professor will look the same uh, in a generation from now than it looks that it looks now because we've inherited a situation. This is what Laguan, Lani Guanier has talked about so eloquently, and I know she's here at this conference, uh, the tyranny of meritocracy. It looks like a fair test. It's not a fair test. It looks like standardized testing that's fair. It's not fair. Right? So if you've got a situation of inequality, of structural inequality, you have to address it with another kind of structure that structures inequality. To me, that's everything. Right? These are class, what I was talking about today are classroom examples. They work for everybody. They're especially important in situations where diversity is the aim. And not just diversity, equality is the aim, and equity is the, is the aim. Thanks very much for that. Okay, I know there were possibly more questions, but I'm sure you can find Kathy after and have a conversation. So I want to thank Kathy Davidson again and the NAC and you for contributing this great talk to our opening night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.